Here's Adam Sussman. No place the Portland Timbers would rather be on decision day than Providence Park, a venue in which they are unbeaten when playing their final MLS regular season game at home. Every Western Conference match night, including Portland hosting Houston here at Providence Park, kicks off just past 6 o'clock, ideal for decision day chaos. Bringing you the column beforehand, I'm your pre- and post-game host, Adam Sussman, speaking to you with the assistance of our on-site engineer, Gunnar Wage, and our studio engineer, Stephen Vaughn. I'm now joined by the duo that will be broadcasting the crucial match tonight, Fletcher Johnson and Keith Blyer. Gentlemen, here we are, a playoff ambition that seemed too steep of a hill has flanned out after hitting a 5-2-2 two two mark under Miles Joseph ever since the 5-0 loss in Houston two months ago. In a few hours, the season for the Portland Timbers could be finished, but it's in their grasp. Win, and you're in the postseason. Here's the magic number on Minnesota. When opponents score more than one goal, which isn't that hard to do, more than one goal, Minnesota is 1-7-5. and five. If the Timbers can get one goal on the board, there's a very great chance they at least draw. And on the other side for Minnesota, with Franco Fragapane out until late July with a thigh injury, Adrian Heath has kind of had a turn to this young trio. Colombian striker Mender Garcia, 24. Korean left winger Sang Bing Jung, 21. And a feel good story is Bang Hukli Ho Lung Wan, a Timber fans know him well because he got that goal at the death. Has four goals this season, six if you include the Open Cup. Still just 22 years old. And a stat I like about him, most fouled player in the league. He gets on the ball, he'll attack you. It will be a long day, most likely for Claudio Bravo at that left back slot with Ulongwani on the right side. So he's someone to keep an eye out for. Coming up next, I talk with Noel Kaliskan of the Portland Timbers this week in preparation for what's looking like his first ever Major League Soccer start. You're going to want to hear that one with the German midfielder. Stay right here on 750 The Game. I would say bar the first goal that was the Espria low crossover to Santiago Moreno, I don't think the other five goals were particularly well worked. Mm. You think about the LA Galaxy goals, it's going to keep Liam Ridgewell up at night because I've been at training about two times per week. Every single session, Liam Ridgewell works with the Timber starters on how to defend and how to score off set pieces. In this game, the first two goals they gave up were off a corner and a set piece that was particularly tough. And then the third goal was a ball that you know was should have been cleared by Noel Kaliskan, hit off of Edwards at an unfortunate angle for the Timbers, and fell right to Douglas Costa, who still had some work to do, but it was not a well-worked goal. So in the first 45, clearly with five goals, neither team really missed a Vander or Pooch. In the second 45, with the game stagnate may not be a right word, but kind of deadened a little bit, that's where you missed Pooch and a Vander because you could have used their creativity to find the forwards a little bit more instead of just kind of built up play amongst the flanks. The central attacking channels were not really used. Coincidentally, the only time they wore was when there was a fullback like Juan David Mascara. There's players across Major League Soccer that are objectively great. Espinosa is a great player. Jordan Morris is a great player. But when the Timbers come against some of these great players, they can kind of cool them off a little bit. They did that today against Christian Espinosa. Jeremy Obobese had the free kick chance. Yes, he had a layoff to Cade Cowell that Eric Miller came in and defended. But in general, as a defender, you have to be happy with what you've seen from them. Giving up zero goals in 270-plus minutes is pretty damn good, especially considering the game before that, they gave up four. You talked about players playing within themselves and kind of being able to express themselves. I don't think Hector Herrera is doing this because where did these assists come from? In 281 club games for Pachuca in Mexico, Porto in Portugal, and before Houston with Atletico Madrid, 22 assists, which averaged out to assist about every 13 games. This year, at 33 years old, a creative renaissance. He has 15 assists. That's second in MLS. I'm not saying he didn't show creative chops abroad, but he was never this chief creator that was averaging an assist every other game. Evander, though, you just look at the numbers. I think some fans were under the impression that he's not having a good to great first season. I'm not saying he's lighting the world on fire, but a lot of these big money first year signings don't hit right away. Look at Hani Mukhtar. You can rewind all the way back to Demir Krylock. A lot of them don't hit right away. And the fact of the matter is, Evander now has nine goals and assists, six goals, three assists, in 17 starts. That's a goal or an assist every other game, Keith. I'm not saying it's incredible. I'm not saying he's going to be a guaranteed all-star. But if he didn't have a, a hip injury earlier in the year, he didn't have a suspension, and he didn't miss one game here and there with a minor injury, he would have had all-star level numbers. So Keith, Fletcher, both of you guys know this well. Once upon a time, it wasn't like this in Chicago. Before the Timbers entered the league, Chicago was a marquee franchise in Major League Soccer. Opening 12 seasons of their existence, MLS Cup champs in their first year, made the playoffs 11 of 12 years, semifinal or better, 9 of 12 seasons. Past 13 years, zero playoff wins. 
have made the postseason two of 13 years and have had eight head coaches since 2011, most recently firing Ezra Hendrickson on May 8th. They have the highest paid player in the league in Jordan Shakiri, at least according to the MLS Players Association. We're yet to hear if he's back from international duty or not for this one. But there's a, a small cause for hope in this one. Chicago has played 15 games versus the Eastern Conference, one win. Two games versus the Western Conference, like the Timbers are in. Two wins, a 1-0 against St. Louis and a 2-1 against Minnesota. So the first part of all that, Adam, uh, the research that you did there makes me think that's from a guy who like grew up in the Chicago area. He grew or up in like the that. probably five years too late because as the time I was getting into soccer around 10, 11 years old, that's the start yeah, of those see 13 that, years. That, <laughs> see, that, that's, that's the mistake that you made. Yeah. You need to be as old as Jake Ziven. Exactly. <laughs> It lets you play with a little bit more freedom, a little bit more attacking prowess in this game against Tigres, considering you got all three points against San Jose. Let's talk about the guests. Giovanni Severes, they called them an elite guest, and they're exactly that. And they're elite against MLS opposition as well. Since facing Portland 15 years ago, Tigres have faced seven teams from MLS, Chicago, RSL, Houston, NYCFC, LAFC, Seattle, and Orlando. Combined record, 10 wins, 3 draws, and 2 losses. But this is the hottest team in the Mexican League right now. They won the Clausura, which ended a few months ago in late May. They beat Chivas Guadalajara in the final. After that, you have the Apatura and you have the Clausura. It's the season split into two. Keith and I will get into it a little bit more during the broadcast. But they played the Apatura champions, Pachuca, and they beat them in the Campeones de Campeones. They have this sense of responsibility where they've kept winning this silver and kept winning this over and over again. If they win this, that's three trophies from an available three right now for them. 12 goals in six games under Miles Joseph. That's nearly a third of the goals in this 30-game schedule so far, coming in just six games under the interim manager. The feeling around the club is certainly positive, and rightfully so, but Fletcher... Don't get it twisted. This is absolutely a match in which you need to collect all three points, considering you're at home and the opposition as well. They're going to have to do it without some familiar characters. Of course, Diego Char remains out with the abdomen issue. And also Christian Paredes, one of the most consistent and best players on the team this season, out through yellow card accumulation. The good news is the midfielders that have been playing are in good form. Evander scored his fourth goal since the League's Cup break alone. And also former Rapids man Brian Acosta had his best showing in Timber Colors last week. They're off to a flying start again, proving 2022 was no fluke. They sit 5-1-2, good for second in the Eastern Conference, only on goal differential with 17 points, and haven't dropped a single point at home, allowing one goal in four games. Keith, after rough spells with Ron Yas and another Dutchman in Yap Stem, they went the American route. Pat Noonan came in. What has he done right with Cincinnati last year, continuing into this year? Alan Velasco, it's incredible he's still so young, and then goes without saying Jesus Ferreira. He's played every minute this season, three goals, had a brace against the Galaxy. I mean, you just go back, even as a teenager, he was scoring eight goals, six assists in this league, and at 22 years old currently, he's seven goals away from tying Kenny Cooper for most goals in FC Dallas history. So this guy could leave the club, hypothetically go to Europe in a year or two, and leave as a 23-year-old, the highest-scoring player in club history already. It, it's frankly incredible. Seven goals for the U.S. men's national team as well. Is he as dangerous of a problem as the Portland Timbers have faced this year? So the Timbers are going to be in their own final third a lot today. We even saw it last time when the Timbers won 4-1. Keith, I think for the first 20 minutes of the second half, I think 19 of it was played in the Timbers' own final third, yeah. which makes the striker issues even more prevalent because they're not living up to their expected goals at all. They have an XG of 28 while they've only scored 21. That's one of the biggest, you know, differences in all of Major League Soccer. They had an XG of 3.3 against San Jose midweek and didn't score. <laughs> and, and you just oh, yeah. you look at their options for this one. Raul Ruiz Diaz, it's a name that strikes fear, and rightfully so. His previous low in Major League Soccer for a season was 9 when he played a curtailed season last year due to injury. But this year, it's injury again. He's only played 278 minutes total across seven games and two starts. Has two goals. He's dealt with injuries, of course. He had 32 minutes off the bench against San Jose. Eber, on the other hand, you know, Timbers fans know Mo from his days at NYCFC. He's struggling after a good start. Two goals in his first two games, but hasn't scored in his last 10, seven of those being starts, including last game. And Keith, you mentioned it as well. No Morris, but Morris is someone, no matter how hot of form, I think he scored, what, seven goals in the first four games? He never seems to do it against Portland, which is weird. Only one goal against the Timbers as a whole, but he's out with a groin issue in this one. And last thing, and then I'll hand it over to you, Keith, for some more Seattle Sounders thoughts. You talked about that change in shape last time they played the Timbers. I remember it exactly. They took out Leo Chu. 
They matched the Timbers 4-4-2, and it all went to hell after that. I wouldn't be surprised if they just stick with their 4-2-3-1 all game and say, hey, we had some bad luck against San Jose. Let's keep doing what we're doing. If we have an XG of three again, they're probably going to at least get one. If the Timbers were completely out of the playoff race, I think we might see some more experimentation and formation, younger players here and there. But ultimately, the Timbers are five points out from the final playoff spot. Yes, they've played one more game, but this is a huge match with Vancouver. Miles Joseph said it in his press conference as well. I don't think there's going to be that much different tactically. I think it's going to be a 4-3-3 again. It's nice to have Diego Chara back in the base of midfield, and it's probably going to be a Vander and Paredes in front of him. So it really is, like Keith mentioned, you can't fire the team. Blanco and Chara took some blame as well as saying, we have players have not been good. Hopefully we see that on the pitch. And look, just a new face on the touchline could make a difference for this team. And, and 10 games to go, it sounds like a small amount, but there's 30 points up to grabs for the Portland Timbers and five points out. You can do the math. They still have a chance here. Funnily enough, I don't think the other midfielders missed Evander too much. I don't think Paredes or Moreno or Casas game was worse because of Evander. I think the person who was most affected by Evander's absence was Claudio Bravo. Because I think Bravo has been one of the Timbers' best players this season, especially since the League's Cup break. We've seen what he's capable of passing, and now that him and Evander know each other really well amongst that left flank, it doesn't matter who the left wing is. He just doesn't have that chemistry with Antony yet. He doesn't have that chemistry with Noel Caliscan or Paredes, who was playing out of position on the right than the left. So I think Claudio Bravo had a, a disappointing game by his standards, but I expect that to change against Montreal. Will Miles Joseph and Portland eliminate chance and grab a win to ensure the seventh seeder will Houston continue to haunt Portland and make it a decision day to forget. The balance of the season can go either way tonight. Timbers, Dynamo, coming up next on 750 The Game.